There are only ever 12 guards on duty, as Kino Loy revealed at the close of last week's episode, and Cassian intends to fully exploit these flaws with episode 10 of Andor. Kino is still hesitant to confront the Imperial officers since he still believes they are in control of the situation, even after realising that nobody is leaving Nakina 5. Because Power doesn't panic, Cassian, of course, doesn't see it that way. Since his arrival at the Imperial production complex, he has been observed how the cops struggle to keep order while covering shifts. Additionally, he has noticed that when the new detainees are introduced to the cops, they are most vulnerable. They need to move quickly in the wake of Olaf's passing. Kino experiences a spiritual crisis as a result of Cassian's assurance that the tide will turn in their favour. He is still tenaciously holding on to hope that he will actually complete his sentence and be released from Nakina 5. He has been an excellent prisoner, keeping his head down and obeying the regulations while supervising the work of other inmates and carrying out his own duties. But Cassian is aware from personal experience that no matter what you do, the Empire will find an excuse to imprison, confine or murder you. Kino doesn't really understand what they want until Cassian says to him, I'd sooner die attempting to take them down than give them what they want. When Cassian tells the other prisoners what happened on level 2, they initially don't believe him, but Kino eventually cracks and says that everything is true and nobody is being let out. While the revolt on Akina 5 dominates episode 10, Andor doesn't ignore the various stories taking place throughout the galaxy. After Krieger's soldiers fell for the trap they set with the pilot, Deidre Miro and the rest of the Imperial Security Bureau celebrate their successful operation. However, one ISP agent didn't seem to be celebrating as much as the others. They must take an interest in the pilot's demise in order to maintain the status quo. Warns Lonnie Jung, lest they arouse Krieger and his men's suspicions. Although the scene appears to be rather simple, it also puts Lonnie in the spotlight and gets viewers ready for the episode's final twist. Naturally, the rebels aren't the only ones who have a spy station to keep their eyes on their adversaries. On Ferrix, a group of locals and Dr. Milmoy discuss Marva's refusal to take her medication because it makes her eat poorly. The sequence definitely illustrates how Kov has been left behind to monitor events near Cassian's Boyard home in addition to Sinta, who is keeping a check on Marva's residence. Even if Kov and Sinter don't often interact, it looks like Andor is prepping viewers for Sinter to encounter trouble on Ferrix. Mon Mothma, who complied with Tay's plan to cooperate with Davos Sikildan in order to channel their money under the Empire's radar, is now dealing with the repercussions on Coruscant. Even though it appears to be just the three of them in Mothma's home, they take great care in how they discuss the situation. Devo's interrogation of her regarding her marriage to Perrin and his admiration of the ancient ways of Chandrilla contained a lot of doublespeak. He makes an effort to persuade Mon to acknowledge that she and Tay are seeking a more flexible banking arrangement for the Foundation in order to bundle their monetary contributions and escape regulatory oversight. She rapidly discovers though that he won't give her anything without getting something in return. He wants to set up a meeting between his adolescent son and her daughter, Leda, who is 13 years old, but he's no interest in charging them a fee for aiding their charity. Mon's panic is palpable as she realises that her daughter might be damned to face a similar situation in order to keep her promise she made to the rebels. Andor has demonstrated what a miserable relationship Mon has with Perrin and has made a point of addressing the fact that they were trapped in an arranged marriage. Mon rejects the proposal even after Devo assures her that he is not searching for betrothal for his son. Nonetheless, Devo argues that this is incorrect. If they plan to continue, Mon is going to have to accept Devo's offer in order to keep the Foundation's financial activities hidden from view, and that knowledge nearly makes her cry. After the dawn of the following day, Kino addresses his unit of inmates on Akina 5 and declares that they are done keeping track of the shifts. Now the truth of the situation has fully dawned on him. His attitude has entirely changed. He tells them that there's only now and then. He doesn't care if he lives or dies since he believes he's already passed away. 
This aspect is particularly noteworthy because it carries over into Cassian all the way up to the events of Scarif. From this point on, Cassian lives as though he's going to die, as we, as the viewer, are aware that he will do whatever to make sure that the Empire is defeated. The dwindling flame inside Nakina 5 is what starts the forest inside of him. After the disruption, on level 2, the convicts aren't the only ones feeling uneasy. The Imperial officials emphasise the idea of collective sanctions for non-compliance and remind the conflicts on the sky bridge that no speaking is permitted during the shift changes. Although the officers may not be aware of what's about to occur, it is obvious that they are aware that if word spreads about the, what truly occurred on level 2, they will only be able to keep the prisoners in check for a limited amount of time. When they begin the shift, Tagger begins to worry that he's going to die. Cassian tries to comfort him despite the fact that there is a very real possibility that none of them will survive to leave Nakina 5. Similar to nobody's listening, Cassian leaves the fresher during the break and starts using his homemade shiv to continue soaring at the pipe. However, before the prisoner transfer is finished, he must be successful in entirely cutting off the pipe. As he struggles with it and resorts to pulling and prodding at it, the tension raises as the clock starts to tick down until everyone is punished for disobedience. Cassian manages to break the pipe and returns to the main room just as Bernock steps into place as the officers ascend onto the platform above him. The officers are running behind and are completely unaware of Cassian's presence as they rush to finish the transfer. Cassian is drenched in water due to the broken pipe, and the prisoners are all beginning to arm themselves with tools. To create even more destruction, Ham and Yaxel start fighting. This allows Cassian to break the lift while Bernock boards to kill the guards. The inmates begin tossing their tools and equipment at the guards as hell breaks loose, turning the tools of the incarceration into their weapons. The prisoners manage to climb up onto the workable tables to avoid being burned when Imperial officers turn on the floor in the last ditch effort to stop the inevitable. However, because of the facility's shoddy construction and the water from the leak that is cascading across the floor, the facility shorts out and is essentially rendered inoperable. The prisoners are able to escape when the floors are inoperable by using the lift to ascend. While Melshi and other remaining inmates make their way to liberate the remaining portions of the factory, Kino and Cassian ascend to the location of the command centre. When Kino and Cassian get to the command centre, they find that there are only three men working there, and one of them has been acting as God's voice has been employing a filter to make the voice sound more menacing. In truth, he's merely a scrawny cop who runs away as soon as one of the colleagues is killed by a gunshot. They are forced to turn the power off to the entire complex to put a stop to the agony once and for all and turning off the floors isn't enough. After weeks of being made to follow orders and obey every rule and direction, Cassian compels the two officers to experience submit in an absolute power manoeuvre. Even though he was the mass behind, behind the escape, Cassian understands that Kino must issue the call to arms for other convicts because he is the one who directs them on daily activities. Although it is a very weak, half-hearted announcement, Kino reluctantly accepts the microphone and informs everyone in the factory that the convicts are now in charge of the facility. Cassian challenges Kino to perform better, and he does a speech that stirs the soul and integrates Cassian's inspirational words for the beginning of the show. What makes the statement so meaningful is that it virtually sums up what Luthen said to Cassian when he was trying to convince him to support the Aldani mission. Wouldn't you rather give it all once for something real and slice off worthless pieces until there's nothing left. This is what authoritarian governments work to stifle and restrict dissent speeches because they are aware of the influence that idea sharing and transmission may have. It only takes one spark. If we can fight half as hard as we've been working, we'd be home in no time. Kino assures the convicts as they begin to escape from the workrooms and cells. But Kino discovers a terrifying discovery that confirms his idea that he was already dead when they ascend to the loading dock from which they were initially carried to the planet. He is unable to swim, and the factory is situated in the midst of a big ocean. Cassian looks back as Kino realises his fate has been sealed as he advances to the brink, triumphant and full of hope. 
Cassian is knocked off the edge in a rush, preventing the two men from saying the final goodbyes. While Cassian and Melchi succeed in reaching land, Kino's fate is left unanswered, though it is simple to assume. Clea, who first appears in the episode, tells Luthen that there have been markings placed all over the city indicating somebody wants to meet with Luthen. Since the last contact was made more than a year ago, a lot has happened, and Clea is concerned that it might be a trap. Luthen appears unconcerned if it's a trap and attends the meeting against what would seem to be better judgement. As expected, Lonnie makes his way to meet Luthen in the lower levels of Coruscant, which are sharp contrast to the stern grandeur of locations like Mon Mothma's home. Initially, hiding his identity, Luthen chooses to speak with Lonnie in a lift to the comm system, when he reveals that he's been keeping an eye on him. Since their last conversation, Lonnie has given birth to a child. Luthen cleverly uses this information as leverage to make sure that Lonnie hasn't tricked him into falling into a trap, which he hasn't. Instead, Lonnie is sure to inform Luthen about Deidre's beliefs about the Axis and how she dismantling Ferex in order to determine who the middle person is, and who was helping the thief they were looking for. To a significant extent, Luthen plays down his interest in Lonnie's intelligence, telling him that he's wasting his time and that he has nothing to do with Aldani. In fact, he refuses to get involved at all. Luthen begins to understand why Lonnie is telling him all this information. So he assures him he's willing to lose 50 of Krieger's men if it means keeping Lonnie's position in the Empire. Lonnie continues to try to appease him with the information he's gathered, revealing the plot with the pilot's death and warning him about Spellhouse. When Lonnie and Luthen finally have a face-to-face -face encounter, Lonnie can finally admit that the only reason he set up the appointment was so he could inform Luthen that he was finished and was considering leaving the ISB because he simply can't stand the pressure any longer. Since the ISB wouldn't allow him to go any further than he plans to, Luthen is quick to point out that Lonnie's idea is absurd. He's been claiming the ranks for six years, yet he's stuck. Broken by what he has to give up for the cause, Lonnie asks Luthen about what he has given up because it doesn't seem to appear he is suffering as much as he has. As Luthen describes the sacrifices he has made to assure the rebellion's survival, his entire demeanour changes. He has given up sincerity, benevolence, kinship and love. He longs to fight injustice and talks to spirits in his dreams. For someone else's future, he sacrifices his morality. To create a sunrise that he will never witness, he burns his life. He has given up all for the uprising. And in a sense, this seals their respective fates. There is no turning back once you join the movement, or join the insurrection. Some part of you has to burn in order for the spark for someone else's flame. There have been some generally mind-blowing ideas, themes, scene designs and performances throughout Nakina 5 arc. Within these three episodes, Circus, Skarg and Forrest Whitaker were the standout performance. Offering performances that showed powerful emotions and subtle ones shown only through changing expressions and potent lips. But what really caused all the commotion with Luna's portrayal of Cassian come to terms with this predicament? It appears that Cassian will have to take action and fight back with a sincere purpose going forward rather than continuing to stand by and watch the Empire. Wow! Luthen's speech at the end. Spine tingling, cold and calculated. It shows the half-life the rebels have to further the cause. Cassian and Kino was also great in this episode with Cassian using his intelligence to pass over the lead for Tino to make a speech to inspire and conquer the prison. Great episode, thoroughly enjoyed it. A prison escape and heartfelt emotional tingling dialogue. Like and subscribe. Until the next time on Star Wars Invader.